Okay, so I'm just going to sort of uh, provide a bit of a, a sort of general overview just to kind of get the, the, the sort of brain cells going on this Monday morning. Um, so it's more kind of a bit of long-term kind of economics, a bit of a sort of socio-political context, environmental context of the sort of the battery metals, what we're calling strategic metals and things like critical metals, all these kind of terms, um, and how all this uh, relates to the, to the energy transition, which is sort of the underlying driver of all this. So I guess the, the first question we should just come to is just to clarify exactly what I mean by the energy transition. Um, so there's a few sort of uh, different trend, uh, major sort of trend shaping uh, global economics and politics at the moment. Uh, one is a massive increase in energy m demand, but at the same time uh, an increased focus on the environment. And this is pushing us obviously towards renewable energy, which is sort of theoretically infinite, non-carbon emission generating at source. Um, but it's also relatively distributed as a source as well, which presents some new problems. Um, and these, this distributed energy combined with uh, an increase in uh, transportation around the world and a desire to take things that require energy around with us all the time um, means that uh, batteries are kind of the, 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 ne the, the sort of, in theory, the, the next big sort of technological leap we need to make as a society. Um, I was reading somewhere, I think we have about enough battery power across the world for about to store about 10%, uh, 10 minutes of the world's um, energy um, at, at any one time. So uh, there's a lot of, uh, lot of scope to, be, uh, to, in to increase that, and we're going to have to if we're going to have these sort of really decentralized kind of societies. Um, obviously, this is opening up uh, new opportunities for what I've dubbed the energy metals, for want of a better term, which broadly split into those that are kind of related to renewables and those that are kind of related to batteries. And obviously, some of these have more than one end use um, as well. Um, so the renewable side, you've got the ones associated with the uh, solar power, the ones associated with uh, wind energy, in particular the motors. I suppose you could argue uranium is, is kind, of, kind of part of this, not technically renewable, but is often associated with energy transition. Uh, and then you have uh, the various battery metals. So we've still got stuff like lead-acid batteries sticking around, still plenty of use of them. But then there's a whole variety of, of uh, re uh, rechargeable battery technologies um, uh, some already sort of fading away, the sort of the nickel-based systems, uh, some, some uh, more on the rise, things like lithium-ion batteries, potentially things like vanadium batteries as well. Um, and it's also worth saying that although there may be a headline metal in each, each of uh, these batteries, there are also a lot of other metals within them. So the classic example is lithium, which also contains probably more graphite, really. Um, cobalt in them as well, and in a lot of the other batteries, uh, tin and things like that often find their way into batteries as well. So not quite every metal is in, uh, in, in a battery metal, but there are quite a lot involved in that industry. Um, moving on to this issue of sort of crit uh, critical or strategic metals, what, what are we actually talking about when we're, when we're sort of using these terms? Um, in a sort of academic sense, there are, there are sort of two versions of criticality. So um, the first thing that any critical metal needs is it needs some kind of important use. It needs to have an economic use, which is fairly, fairly obvious. Um, but then there are sort of two ways in which it can sort of become critical. One is a, as a more sort of strategic um, paradigm, which is where sort of the uneven distribution of uh, deposits around the world means that one country or company or this sort of group would have control over the power of, of, of that. So the classic example being the rare earths in, in China, um, and that you know could be argued to have military implications for the for the West and things like that. So that's what we talk about when we talk about strategic metal. Um, the other the other element of criticality is, is more a sort of environmental, uh, socio political angle, which is that if um, the, the, there are problems with extracting a metal and, and using a metal, um, society may wish to restrict that. Um, uh, which in turn would, would restrict the supply t to the consumer. So, you know, one example again could be in China, there have been issues with, with graphite mining, um, which could affect graphite supply. There have been issues with rare earths, which could affect rare earth supply. We're all familiar with the problems around uranium mining and things like that. So that's, that's where that comes along. So there have been a number of different studies, uh, mainly done by governments, on, on what exactly a, the, a critical metal is and which ones they are. And the chart on the very far uh, well, be, be right to you. 
um, is, is a sort of a list of all the various different um, critical metals that have, have been described by one report or another with the bigger the, the, the word, the more frequently it pops up in, the, in, the, in these surveys. Um, and the ones in orange are the, the battery metals. The sort of battery metals, ones in blue, more associated with renewables. But as you can see, there are a few of these um, battery metals and renewable energy metals that certainly do overlap with these sort of critical strategic metals uh, area as well. So we're, you know, we're discussing lots of the same things here, even if they aren't specifically the same idea. Um, one of the reasons why these these metals are so critical is because they are minor metals markets, and by that I mean. We don't mine a lot of them at the moment, and historically we haven't mined a lot of them easier. So e either, so this this reduce uh, re eliminates one of the possible routes to increasing supply, which is increasing secondary or recycl recycled supply. Um, for a lot of these metals, gallium and in indium and lithium, for example, there isn't actually th that much of a sort of historical uh, historically mined resource available for recycling. Um, we just haven't mined that much of it in the past. So compared to even our current uses, we don't really have a lot already above ground. And compared to the projections of what we want to use of these metals, we have essentially very, very little. Um, so we are going to have to mine a lot of these uh, one way or another. Um, the other issue that's sort of um, affecting the why we're going to have to mine these rather than uh, recycle them is that we don't actually recycle metals, we recycle products. Um, you know, we take our paper and newspapers and stuff and bottles to the bottle bank. Um, we don't take sort of silica to the, to the bottle bank. Um, so, for example, looking at um, lithium, of, of the various uses of lithium, you could argue that actually we could set up a, a lithium battery recycling um, system. That, that doesn't seem too beyond, uh, beyond technical um, probability. But some of, the, some of the uses, like in fluxes and ceramics, um, as, a, as an additive into aluminium, you're just never going to get that lithium back. So it's, it's lost in the system, so you can't, can't recycle that. Um, and the, the best example, a, a way of, in a way, of a, a very recyclable metal is one of the most sort of environmentally toxic metals, ironically, which is lead, which is because most lead is used in uh, car batteries. You have a very effective product recycling loop there. So actually, lead is very, very, very easy to recycle, and also it's low temperature reasonably easy to, to, to on, a, on the metallurgy side. So the, the recycling is not an obvious route for a lot of these metals. Similarly, um, what actually happens when you don't have a, um, an effective recycling loop is it all ends up in landfill one way or the other. Um, there are ideas to mine landfill, but as the images there show, you know, I think landfill mining probably has more problems with um, societal sort of uh, acceptance than actual mining does. Um, so again, not an easy route out. So, us as a mining sector in this room, obviously we've um, we've got ourselves involved in it. We've now been through a series of um, energy metal-related booms: uranium, lithium, rare earths, graphite, lithium again, a bit of cobalt recently as well. Um, but actually, I think as a sector, we, we've we've probably not seen the best of it so far. We, there's been a lot of a lot of problems in you know, we can identify the opportunity, but we can't seem to quite capture it. Um, and indeed, when you look at the statistics, this isn't a simple story. Um, certainly, these, these minor metals markets have not really grown any faster than the other metals markets, and probably slower than a lot of precious metal markets. And individually, looking at just even a price level, as, as you may expect, some are up, some are down. It's, this is not a clear and simple, straightforward story. It's not just anything associated with the energy transition is good. Um, so what, what are we going to need to sort of see some of these metals become sort of major sort of industrial markets we're hoping? We have seen this kind of thing before. So back in the, the 19th century, aluminium was a, as a precious metal. It was more valuable than silver and heading up towards gold. Um, very, very little of it mined. Whereas now, of course, it's one of the, the largest commodity, uh, metals commodity markets we have. Um, there's a similar story of nickel, um, sort of uh, in, in, the, in the 20th century, uh, really taking off um, uh, in association with the two, two world wars. Uh, and again, uranium might be an example of another market that post, post Second World War kind of went from essentially nothing to a, a market worth a few, a few billion dollars. So you do, get, you do get these markets that occasionally just go from nothing and 
convert into a, a quite a substantial industrial market and, 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 and stay there. It's not a boom and bust type thing. Obviously, within that, they then have their cycles up and down. So what, what drove this? Well, as we all know, it's, it's supply and demand. And of course, as geologists would also point to the role of discovery. So with aluminium, people often readily highlight aviation demand, but also the the bio and whole horror process, processes invented in the late 19th century important. We didn't really get around to bulk open pit mining to the beginning of the 20th century. That was required, but bauxite's quite difficult to mine underground. And of course, you needed big bauxite discoveries, which were made again in the Americas towards the end of the 19th century. Um, similar story for nickel. Again, everyone can pretty much point to the, the demand, military demand for, for nickel. But really, it was, again, it was the combination of improvements in flotation and nickel smelting uh, bulk open pit mining and the discovery of uh, Sudbury and, and uh, the New, New Caledonia deposits as well that got things going. Um, again, similar story of uranium. We all know the demand uses, but there were some technical hurdles that had to be overcome. Obviously, with the ability to handle radiation. Uh, bulk mining was important because initially uranium was a byproduct of radium, which is very, very low concentration. And of course, we needed the discoveries, which uh, main ones which were made in Congo at the time. So it's a combination of factors that allows these markets to grow. It's not just the demand. Basically, there needs to be a way of supplying them as well. So looking at the current um, crop of uh, battery and, and uh, energy metals, um, sort of applying the sort of same theory, um, which of them are relatively sort of unconstrained, which of them are actually sort of reasonably abundant and occur in min good mineral deposits, relatively straightforward to mine and process, and have a decent end use market, by which I mean there's both of the important uses, but also there's a good broad range of uses. You know, the, 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 the thing about an industrial metal is they're used for many, many things, which actually makes them relatively stable uh, market and, and, and a useful material to source. You don't want them spiking up and down uh, from the point of view of a, a consumer just because of the, 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 the economics of one particular industry. Um, and when you do this kind of analysis, actually, if enough graphite comes out, um, pretty good. So it's, it's, it, I think we, we all recognize this. It's actually relatively abundant. It's reasonably straightforward to find and mine, certainly in, in comparison to some other metals. Um, uh, so you know that, that, that has potential. You could see a, a, a large graphite market in the future. Um, similarly, things like cobalt and lithium, um, battery metals as well. You know, again, you could see these markets with a few uh, technological hurdles in the case of lithium sort of overcome. There is actually a reasonable chance that these could become um, you know, large industrial metal markets. Um, some of the others, it's more challenging. So if you look towards things like uh, the, the rare earths, they are techno technologically, socially, and environmentally challenging metals at the moment to, to extract. So it's that, uh, combined with that, things like dysrhosium are just fundamentally rare. Um, so it's harder to see them becoming a major uh, industrial metal market. To me, that, that perhaps there will always be a sort of a somewhat niche um, uh, industrial metals market. Doesn't mean they can't be profitable for the miner, but it, it, they won't be sort of the new copper or the new aluminium. Um, so this just this chart just sort of gives you a bit of an indication of, of sort of the ones that, that the constraints on these on these markets for their growth and also the potential that they can grow. Obviously, the more abundant something is in the crust, the uh, larger the market it can support, but also. Um, the smaller the market at the moment in comparison to what it could be is important. So actually something like nickel and zinc, which there's not really any crustal abundance problems with, they, we will struggle to see a transformational growth in these markets just because they've already had it. We actually mine quite a lot of these metals relative to their abundance already. So they're not going to expand hugely. Whereas things like magnesium and uh, manganese and uh, vanadium, uh, some of the, the lighter rare earths like uh, lanthanum, again, relative, actually relatively abundant, but we don't mine very much of them at the moment. So there is larger scope for them to become a larger market. Um, but it's not quite as simple as that either. This is a, a sort of a little case study I like, which talks about sort of, it's sort of the, the devilish difficulty of trying to do the right thing environmentally. So uh, one of the things that's been going on is the energy transition is driving the requirement for electric vehicles, which in turn required better motor magnets, which pushed them technologically towards the rare earth magnets, which are a superior magnet. Uh, this led to, well, at least if not the, an increased uh, amount of mining in, of rare earths in China, it led to a realization that we mine rare earths mainly in China, 
which uh, could be of all sorts of questionable environmental and social impacts, particularly for the heavier air earths associated with the clays. And actually, when you run a sort of full life cycle analysis of, of using a rare earth magnet, it's actually worse than using the original ferric magnet. So if you were taking a, a sort of a holistic, um, sustainable approach, you should be using ferric magnets, even though they're not as, not as good, uh, rather than, than, than rare earth magnets. So it sort of shows you these, these various little traps you can kind of get yourselves into with, with these markets with lots of competing demands. Um, so I'm not saying that we need to switch back the, to the magnet. I'm just sort of pointing out that this is certainly not a, a straightforward issue. So when, again, once you sort of try and um, plot, of, you know, the, the, this sort of idea of, the, the of not only technical but also societal constraints, um, and whether they're actually resolvable or not. For example, we can technologically we can improve processing techniques, but we can't make a element more abundant in the crust. Um, similarly, on social constraints, things like uh, conflicts and uh, poor environmental management practices and pollution can be can be resolved. Um, but something that is fundamentally toxic or radioactive, it, it's always going to be. You can get better at handling it, but that's always going to be a problem. Um, again, when you look at it in this, in some of the some of the battery metals um, uh, jump out as either resol resolvable on a societal or uh, technical level. Things like uh, lithium, graphite, vanadium, manganese, cobalt, all have again sort of reasonable potential for us to actually be able to solve the problems and get a good good return back from solving these problems. Um, it's probably at this stage also worth noting that we as a mining sector will to a certain extent drive the energy transition. It will be partly defined not just by which sort of technologies people want to use, it will also be defined by which raw materials we can make available. Um, and we will be impacted by this energy transition as well. We are, of course, a major energy consumer, um, usually sort of 20, 10 to 20, even 30 percent of, of your site costs as some kind of energy, energy or fuel. Um, and unsurprisingly, we've already started seeing mining companies uh, embracing various renewable technologies. In, in some ways, mining is just quite a good one for this. It's quite capital intensive already. And generally, the operations are in remote places, off grid and things like that. So actually, a sort of uh, some kind of solar power and battery facility or wind power and battery facility is actually not an unsensible way of, of uh, addressing that issue. Um, so we, to a certain extent, may sort of help drive some of these technologies forward. But there's actually quite a complex sort of set of factors kind of pushing us towards a slightly different kind of way of mining in the future. So on one side, we have a number of things pushing us towards sort of what I would call all electric underground mining. So there's the obvious focus on reducing carbon emissions, but also there's big focus on re uh, diesel emissions and uh, uh, NOx and SOx emissions as well at the moment. Um, all of these sort of health and safety type issues are pushing us towards uh, electric battery driven vehicles, which has been facilitated by better ba battery technology. On the other side, we have a number of factors potentially pushing us towards underground mining, which is a, a focus on the social environmental footprint of surface mining. Open pits are big, ugly and getting away. Um, fewer surface Mineral deposits um, awaiting discovery, we're having to explore at depth or uncover. Um, and this combined with sort of improved automation and remote technologies, which actually takes people out of the underground mining area, so therefore makes it safer, um, is all pushing us towards underground mining. Um, so together we're sort of potentially heading towards a situation of, of more sort of ele all electric underground mining. So, you know, th there's, there's all sorts of complex things going on that, that sort of, you know, we are driving energy tra tra uh, transition, which is driving us uh, kind of situation. Um, so when you have sort of these really complex sort of feedback loops with lots of things interacting on each other, in some ways doing just a standard analysis of plotting charts forward kind of doesn't work. You end up with the, the situation you had with the, the, the rare earth um, uh, magnets in that you, you, project, you, you try to do one thing for one reason but cause loads of side effects the other way. So this is where scenario planning can be quite useful. Um, so one of the scenarios exercises I did with the Center for Exploration Targeting last year ended up sort of settling on, on this kind of two scenarios for the, for the energy transition. So if you can imagine that we live in, our current world was kind of dubbed the disk world, it's the old world, uh, we don't, it's a bit, bit myth, mythology driven sometimes maybe. Um, 
but we're sort of, we have to be quite good still. We don't know when this energy transition is coming, basically. So we feel like we're in it at the moment. We don't know how long it'll last. Some of us think we're not in it. Some of us think we're past it. So there's a sort of lot of uncertainty about it. There's then the transition, which we thought was like the wardrobe in the line, the witch in the wardrobe. Um, you go in, you don't really know what you're going to get on the other side. Um, and it could be quite, quite um, uh, both exciting and scary, I think, is the way you would describe uh, what is on the uh, Narnia. Um, we then said there's sort of two different sort of uh, scenarios that could develop. One is the sort of Alice in Wonderland scenario, which, if you remember from the beginning, is more of a sustainability-focused world where we, we resolve those issues. And then the other is a, a sort of 1984-type scenario, which is where there's much more focus on the strategic use of uh, metals. Um, so we're all, all familiar with the kind of disc world. It's where we all live now. So clearly the, the, there is potentially going to be some change, but how will this change occur? We don't know. We need to go through the wardrobe. And the two things that underlie, there's a bit of storytelling in this, that underlie how these scenarios work is there's basically two ways of, of, of telling a story. Uh, one is the sort of creation story, which is you start here and you go upwards to the, to the point. Um, that's actually very common in Eastern culture. Uh, we as Westerners prefer a, a Hollywood story, which is more along the lines of man in a hole, and it usually is a man, to be fair, in Hollywood, um, where basically you have something, and then it goes wrong, and then you overcome the challenge and, and, uh, uh, and, and have success and glory in the end. Uh, we as Westerners like to um, have a crisis to move us forward. Um, so that's the two sort of models. So the Wonderland scenario is a bit more that kind of, um, it's a sort of, Eastern mythologies crossed with Silicon Valley, sort of, we will, we will go ahead and change the future, we will drive the future forward. Uh, Elon Musk and Tesla will solve all our problems, uh, backed up by globalization and, you know, climate change policy all nicely agreed together. Um, there are some downsides. This is probably going to be a fairly disruptive society, um, uh, lots of technological change. Um, the other scenario is, is one that's seeming possibly a little bit more familiar at the moment, which is Great, great nations falling out of each other, protectionist walls rising, military industrial complex. And essentially you, you end up with some parts of the world which have transitioned um, because in a sense they had a shortage, uh, shortage of oil. So if you look somewhere like um, Europe, if, if there was massive trouble in the Middle East, it's actually very, very vulnerable. So the renewable energy is not just there for sustainable reasons, it's there for strategic importance. So that sort of is a different way of getting through the transition. That's the having a crisis to solve the, the issue kind of transition. Um, so what does all this mean for, well, us, the, the mining companies, the geologists, and, and uh, uh, the, the, the investors? Well, we'd have to kind of operate differently in these, these two different worlds. In the, the, the sort of Wonderland scenario, it's very much a sort of innovators win kind of future. So very good at spotting the innovations on the ground, the next great disruptor, the next person who's designing the battery in the shed in wherever. Um, we're probably going to have to get pretty good at understanding these niche markets. So actually having a seminar like this is a good, good start. Um, and also you're going to have to have that ability to scale globally. You're gonna, it's, everything's going to be a networked world. So it's gonna be, you have to be, you're going to be Facebook or you're going to be MySpace, basically. You know, you're going you're to be big or you, you go nowhere. Um, there's going to be one or two technologies, be it batteries, hybrid cars, renewable energy sources, that essentially work and dominate. So get, backing them early is going to be critical. Um, however, the advantage is always going to be temporary because it's a disruptive, technologically sophisticated world which changes over very, very quickly. So the advantage is always temporary. The 1984 scenario is a little bit different in the sense that um, it's much more about working with, with government, um, potentially things like exploration incentive schemes. You can kind of imagine being backed a lot in this. There's no real chance to scale globally. You're always within your sort of your block. So it's really understanding your local market and what's available um, to you in that area. And in this sense, technologies, there'll be lots of different technologies in different parts of the world. And it really is just about being just good enough. Um, and it's actually a relatively sort of slow changing and stable uh, world for us as the professional geologists and our engineering friends and, and, and whatsoever. Slightly, slightly different uh, world of sort of a civil service kind of geologist type world. Um, so just to, to wrap up, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, the energy transition is going to have a substantial impact on a number of these minor metals markets, which we keep having seminars on. Um, in particular, the, there's a focus on battery metals and what I've called renewable metals, which 
uh, because they're used in renewable technologies, not because they are renewable. Um, however, the ones that will succeed are the ones that overcome the various constraints, be they geological, technical, environmental, or social. Um, we as a mining industry may also drive things as well, um, at least in how, what, which ones we make available to society, and also in potentially applying battery and renewable energy technologies. Some seem to have a better chance than others, lithium, vanadium, et cetera, uh, silicon, gallium. Um, the, but in the end, it's, it's going to be sort of, it's, it's kind of society that will choose what, what works, not, not the technology. If you know, we, we don't get to choose in a sense. It's more what society accepts. And that's kind of the, the thing that, that's the great unknown. So this is where this kind of strategy of, of sort of, there's an energy transition. We don't know when it's going to be, and we don't know what it's going to look like on the, on the other side. So we're going to have to prepare for that, um, which is going to be quite difficult. But I would suggest that sort of some approaches you can take are that t essentially targeting the, the metals that have the most potential for substantial market growth, though I would point out that's not a guarantee of profits. Um, and approaching these in a, in a relatively holistic, holistic manner, sort of being cognizant of the fact that all of the constraints need resolving. So you can't just solve it with the next great processing technology or the next great mineral discovery. It's, it's probably going to be a wider effort than that. Uh, I think we have seen those lessons in things like the rare earth industry and the lithium industry over the last decade. Um, and like I say, you need to be ready for this three-stage approach. You kind of need to not, don't jump too early. You st still need to make, you know, make good business, business now. But you also need to see the energy transition if and when it arrives and if we're already in it. Um, and then you need to be ready to thrive in the future, but you just don't know what it's going to be. So on that, I'll uh, leave you to, to think, think that. Thank you.